Can everyone hear me okay? I don't know if this is working. Good. Thank you. Give me a second to pull this up. <coughs> so I'm grateful for Dr. Holt warming you guys all up. We'll try to finish quickly here and on time. <coughs> I just want to begin by thanking Dr. Warner and Dr. Mamelis and everyone I was able to work with on this project. I really appreciate everything, especially Dr. Warner was able to do for me and get me here today and uh, for ground rounds presentation. So thank you very much, Dr. Liliana Warner. So start off, not, not very many of you know who I am. There's the oddball that was sitting in the front. Why does anyone sit in the front? Um, so my name's Kevin Kirk. I'm from a very rural town, southeast Utah, Blanding, Utah. I grew up hunting, fishing, trapping in those canyons and mountains all over that area. Um, who I am today, I have family and I have a beautiful wife, two perfect children, and I'm a third year medical student here at the University of Utah. I'm, uh, I came to medical school with the sole purpose of going into ophthalmology. If, if medical school wasn't how you became an ophthalmologist, I would have chose that other route to become there. And that was, I don't know how five or six years ago I knew it was the perfect field, but I still feel that way. And after a lot of school, a lot of research, a lot of personal reflection, I still feel very strongly that way, more than ever. So, a couple pictures just of my family and situation. So, this uh, presentation is based on a summer research project I did between the years of my first and second year of medical school. Um, I started out, I was, when I first got here to medical school, I didn't know what to do. I was interested in ophthalmology very strongly. I was told to contact Brian Zog, and I did. And uh, <laughs> he set me up with Dr. Warner right off the get go. I mean, probably the first week of medical school. I'd only lived here for two weeks, maybe. Um, and she got me going right away with rabbit studies or whatever it may be, and I was able to meet a lot of other great physicians, Dr. Mamlis especially, and that summer we did this project, and it's, it was a grant that's here at the University of Utah, a lot of first year and second year students do it. All the work was done in the Warner Mamlis lab, and, and I appreciate all the help that they did. Um, this this presentation is built on this paper that was published in Ophthalmology in, t in 2012. Um, it was, so, where we'd like to start. This is the nuts and bolts of the this is the nuts and bolts of the presentation. So we're going to focus on these two lenses. I felt like this is what I want to do when I'm pointing, but you know these two lenses. Um, these are electron micros uh, electron microscopes, scanning electron microscopes, showing the the design of these lenses. There's a very sharp square edge to these lenses, um, and this is what this is what we're going to focus on. This is kind of the root of what's going on. Exactly, thank you. These are the Acrosoft, the Alcon Acrosoft single piece and then three piece lens. So it's two different, two different lenses we're looking at kind of just in compar not in comparison to each other, but just looking at individually and the pathology that um, comes with asymmetric fixation out of the bag. So the square edge, like I mentioned, is the focus of it. It's a great, it's a great design when it's placed in the bag. The idea is that it's supposed to prevent posterior capsule opacification. The idea when it's out of the bag and what our study is about is it causes damage. It's kind of a sharp, abrasive edge that can rub on structures of the eye. Um, here, this is, a, this is nothing new. We know that the single piece uh, Acrosoft lens is not intended for implantation outside of the capsule bag. These are the reasons why it's not, in, it's not planned for that. It has those rounds, those square edges and on, the on the optic and the haptic. Uh, additionally, it's just it's not the right size. There's kind of a bulky, large haptic. Um, there's unpolished rough sidewalls. The haptic's very flat. It, uh, the, it's not very big, so once it's out of the bag, it's a little too short. That can cause it to not fit perfectly in the ciliary sulcus, which then can lead to some decentration. Um, and, it causes, and then these are some of the complications that we see. Uh, the the uv uveitis glaucoma hyphemus, hyphema syndrome. Similar complications were also found with the three-piece Acrosoft lens. We're not going to go into all of them. Whether they were put in in standard sulcus fixation, that means just by themselves, or put in as a piggyback with another lens behind them. Uh, these are two papers that show some of these complications that I mentioned earlier. One thing I thought of mentioning here in this bottom paper, one thing they mentioned is kind of the versatility of the three the three piece lens. How they saw it as kind of this this very utility lens that if you rupture the posterior capsule, that it was a great lens to put in. This, I don't want to say great lens. They said it was a lens that you could put in the ciliary sulcus. But they did mention all these complications that we're going to talk about. So this is kind of where the focus of our study goes, which, we, which has been shown by Dr. Mamelis and Dr. Warner in these other studies, showing clinical evidence with these three cases 
of asymmetric implantation out of the bag of these Acrosoft lenses. You can see here kind of where a haptic is rubbed on the eye here and you know, caused some obvious clinical damage that we can see clinically. So here is the purpose of this study in this paper. It's a path, it's, we're here to provide pathological evidence. We might not all be quite as interested as Dr. Mamlis is in pathology, but I, I beg you to stay with me here and we'll just listen to it all here. Um, the purpose was to document these things, to show the evidence with uh, both histopathology and the clinical evidences that we get. So here's just a picture of two different single piece IOLs. You can see the, the haptic that's not, in the that's not in the capsular bag, that's out of the bag. This side's out of the bag on this one. This one's not as evident, the, the problems that are happening back here, where this is you know, very evident. This is just some light shining on it, and uh, we're able to see a lot of the damage that's caused there. Um, so this is what we were used to seeing clinically, but we were going to look at things that happens that we can't see with our naked eye. Here's the, here's the process that we went through. 661 eyes, they're all cadaverized, that have been collected from uh, eye banks nationwide. Dr. Mamlis, Dr. Warner especially has this giant, I mean 550 plus are just up in their lab up there, just tons of information is there. So 256 were the Acrosoft lens, only 18 we found with asymmetric fixation. Um, we compared these wherever possible to the, to the eye of the other side of the cadaver. Oftentimes it was an in the bag fixation compared to an out of the bag fixation, which made for a nice control, a nice comparison. The process goes like this, is where they have this, this machine up there, this ultrasound machine that takes nice pictures. We put the whole eye in there, take some pictures, and gives us these beautiful pictures that look something like this. And you can see on these pictures, it's even easy to see here, these are two eyes from the study. You can see the tilt of the IOL, this is the IOL here. You can see the decentration, how it's not fit perfectly over that pupil. Additional eyes were donated or acquired from another group, a group that did an MRI research. And these gave us, again, some really pretty pictures that they had done, but we were able to again see that decentration, that tilt, and kind of document those pictures accordingly just with that, those, those photographs. This right here, Brian Zog might be familiar with this, he did a ton of this research. This started off with Dr. Zog years ago and many people have contributed to this. Basically we'd take the eye, if you look and this be the eye, if this be up by the cornea, the front of the eye, we'd cut it in half, put the eye, look from the posterior side with the microscope just like this, and we'd look posterior through it, and we'd give it a grade based on these kind of parameters. Things we looked at were like the capsular, the capsular excess coverage, ACO, anterior capsular opacification, if it's fixated in the bag or not, peripheral PCO, central PCO, and then the summerings ring, we did a grade for how dense it was and if it was in all four quadrants. We didn't do this just for the 18 eyes that I did in my study, we did this for all 600 plus eyes. This is years and years of effort that's been put in and appreciate everybody's effort that put in time in here. So which provided this giant Excel file. I was scared every time I opened this thing. It was like I changed it, I opened it, I was like, oh this is years of work. I didn't want to screw anything up, lose anything. It had me on my toes every time. But all it, it is is just a, a rich, very thick, tons of information for Dr. Liliana Warner and Mam Dr. Mamlis to work with and they have this for all 600 eyes and it's a great great reference. So we went through this after doing, after going through all the rest of the cadaverizing and grading them and picked out all the asymmetric uh, Acrosoft lenses and put them into this study. And so here you see here, six of the lenses that were in my study. These top three were all uh, single piece and these bottom three are three pieces. Um, some things to mention and notice here, all 600 eyes had these pictures taken and they're beautiful pictures that you know bring a lot of color to the paper but uh, they also show a lot of things. You can see some of the pathology which we mentioned just grossly. But one thing I want to bring some attention to here in the three piece, there's this area right here. Now this is, this is part of our finding, I just want to show it, that not all the pathology we found could we attribute to the asymmetric fixation. Some of it looks to be like due to complicated surgery, whether that's like a phaco tip or something, something possibly caused that outside of the IOL. But otherwise, you can really see that most of the pathology followed the side that the haptic was not in the bag which is kind of good in our situation, but that's what we were looking for. We explanted two of these IOLs before we did any histopathology uh, cutting and anything, and just looked under, a mic under the light microscope at them. You can see the pigment on them. This is on the haptic of a single piece. You can see it right here on the square edge. It had rubbed off that pigment, and again in this haptic. These were the two haptics that were out of the bag in the ciliary sulcus there. 
this is a busy slide, it's got a lot on it, but I kind of want you just to draw your attention to this far right, this far side over here. What I want you to notice for decentration tilt, pigment, iris translumination defect, you're seeing mostly moderate, severe def problems. That's, that's for the asymmetric or the out of the bag fixated lenses. Of note as well, the top ones are the single piece and the bottom ones are the three piece. And one thing that's very interesting that we found later is for most of the single pieces, they had their capsule, their posterior capsule intact, whereas most of the three pieces had their posterior capsule ruptured, whereas the eye procedure, something like this. So what made that, what brought that to our attention, what helped us with this study is it showing that the three piece often had complicated surgery, showed a lot of complicated, showed, just showed complications during surgery. This is the control eyes. We didn't have as many control eyes because not every single eye had a contralateral comparison. But as you see here, again, bringing over to the side, you see mostly mild or no decentration, tilt, iris defect. So just grossly, it was very obvious that, you know, there was the in the bag fixation was a lot better than out of the bag or asymmetric fixation. And you can see the posterior capsule, most of those were intact. And here is one of the prettiest slides, but also a lot of the bread and butter of my, of my, of the paper in this presentation. This is um, the histopathology that we were able to look at with a, and a special thank to Dr. Mamlis and his expertise that makes this possible. Um, we sat down and talked, to, talked about these things and you can see some of the pathology here. I'll try to point some out where possible. You can see the trabecular meshwork, you see a lot of pigment in it that, uh, that is accumulating, you know, possibly from that, ru that rubbing of that uh, square edge, leaving the pigment in the trabecular meshwork. You see uh, breaks in the pigment, you see this thinning or this, or this pigment that's on what looks to be the capsulary, the capsule bag. This is something we found in the for all the th for some of the three piece eyes we were seeing that where the sulc where the uh, haptic was eroding into the sulcus, you can see here where the haptic is actually there. That's the little round three piece haptic sitting there. So a lot of great um, pathology shown here. One of the thing that was of great of real of perfect interest for the study was more pathology was seen on the side that the haptic was out of the bag in than on the side that is in the bag. We just you know was able to mark those by when we cut them and looked at them and seeing what side was what, but it showed a lot more damage on the, half the side that was out, so kind of verifying what we were hoping to find. The majority of the three-piece lenses, though, showed complicated surgeries rather than just the general pathology we saw in a lot of the single pieces. So I don't want you to get too excited because every time I saw Dr. Dr. Holt change slides, I was like, oh, is it my turn? Is it my turn? It's not quite the end. Two more slides, so hang with me. But for the first paper, <laughs> we were... Uh, we, what we were able to show was pathological correlation for the single piece. It matched the review, the, the literature that was reviewed. Um, we found a lot of the similar problems. And so we were able to say that with the single piece hydrophobic acrylic IOLs. But for the three piece, we weren't able to say that as much. We were able to say that they were not maybe completely um, due to the asymmetric fixation. It might have been partly due to the complicated surgeries. So this was the conclusion of that first paper I did that first, that first summer. Like I said, two more slides, so hold on. There's one. <coughs> Another study that was done in the Mamlis Warner lab was this follow-up study, and this is a great picture. I think this is such a great study, too. So this is comparing now the three-piece square edge to a three-piece round anterior edge, and I think this is the, the scanning electron microscope shows this great. So the idea is it's not as sharp, not, not as abrasive of a, of a surface there. This paper was also, was, is also submitted to ophthalmology. It's currently in print. Um, for 2013. Let's see. Here is our conclusions of that study. All the methods, all the similar gross things were pretty much the same, which, which makes something very interesting. Anytime you had an asymmetric fixation, we saw a lot of the similar gross findings, whether that be decentration, tilt, iris defects, or whatever it is. There was, whether it was the round anterior edge or the square edge, they all had similar findings in that regard. But when we dug a little deeper, compared the histopathology and everything else, the conclusion was that the, the square anterior and posterior edge, so the one that was originally in my study, showed greater pathology with more pigment in the trabecular meshwork. This uh, indicates that there was probably more trauma going on to that posterior edge of the iris, leading to more uh, pigment being dispersed throughout the eye. So our results and our final conclusion of that paper was that three-piece round edges were more suitable for the sulcus fixated, which kind of makes sense. But this, again, is just documenting and showing those things that we all know. Um, of note in these, this study as well, um, 
whether it was the round edge or the square edge, any haptic that was out of the bag, that slide showed more pathology again, just like the first paper, which I think uh, is a very interesting finding. So, which we all know, and I'll probably, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say we all know, because I don't know if I include myself, but you guys all know that do these surgeries, in the bag fixation is always a lot better. We're here just, we were able to show and document these pathological findings of the three piece and single piece of when they were placed asymmetrically or out of the bag. Um, so with that, that concludes a series of the, of the Sulcus fixated uh, I IOLs of the Acrosoft. Um, appreciate everyone waiting and listening for a minute. Uh, strong teeth, I don't know, they're not bent or anything, but that's what we do at home my house. Is there any questions? <laughs> Dr. Horner.